you all have heard of Dionysius, who most people tend to connect to Bacchus, the, the drunken late Roman god of wine. But the early Dionysius is a much, much weirder figure. The early Dionysius uh, is uh, an androgyne, always in the company of women, a god of ecstatic frenzy. And what the enemies of the Dionysian religion always claimed was, first of all, women were the the major followers of Dionysius, and they would uh, intoxicate themselves in some way, and then holding hands, dance through the countryside and uh, and uh, rend their clothing and just carry on outrageously. And what the enemies of the Dionysian religion claimed was that they became so frenzied that these women, who were called Manaeids, uh, ate their own children. This was the lie spread about the Dionysian religion. Well, the story of the birth of Dionysius is very interesting because his father was Zeus, the hidden higher all father, analogous to God the Father in Christianity, but his mother was Simila. And in some versions, Simila is a mortal woman, the daughter of King Cadmus of Thebes, but in other versions, she's herself some kind of a goddess. Anyway, she was one of these many affairs that Zeus had. He was always impregnating women and, and bearing children. And uh, in the eighth month of her pregnancy, she was struck by lightning and killed. And she was very dear to Zeus. And when he came upon her dead, he immediately performed a caesarean operation and he cut open his thigh and he put the child into his own thigh and laced up the wound and the child was born out of the wound six weeks later. Now this may be grotesque and peculiar but notice that what we have here is something close to a virgin birth. It's uh, it's born of the father, is what we have. And Dionysius was then called the twice-born god because he was born once by Caesarean section from his mother and born again six weeks later from the thigh of the father. And it's thought that this Dionysian impulse in the hands of these uh, mystical Jews became then the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception and the whole notion of an immaculately conceived child. Christ is a type of Isaias. I mean, it's heresy to say so, but comparative religionists have been saying this for centuries. Uh, Dionysius was a religion of, of orgy and ecstasy, typical of this period in Greece. Another religious system that was sort of complementing the Hermetica and developing alongside it was um, Gnosticism. And, you know, I said a few minutes ago that the psychology of the late West Roman Empire was very modern. Gnosticism is a very, very modern impulse. It may not at first appear so because ancient Gnosticism is freighted with angels, demons, what we would call superstition. But if you strip away all that Baroque stuff, you come to a philosophy very similar to the philosophy that many of us have accepted really without thinking. We just call it modern attitudes, but the idea in Gnosticism is that you're on your own, you know, there, there ain't no free lunch, if, a God, if God did make the universe, he disappeared shortly afterwards and has no interest in you, your fate, your fears, your hope, uh, we don't belong, Gnostics were profoundly phobic of the world, and uh, 
they uh, were either very ascetic cults or they were very uh, libertine-like cults springing from the same idea, which was that they did not belong in this universe. They were from a different place, and their whole concern was to escape. They are the ones who decided that the earth is an iron prison. Uh, they didn't like to have children because they felt that to have a child is to trap light in matter. The only, in many Gnostic sects, the only forms of sexual activity that they approved of were forms that were guaranteed to not lead to conception. So oral sex, anal sex, whatever. But never sex which could lead to conception because that would trap the light. And that was an abomination. Needless to say, these sects died out in a hurry uh, because they were self-limiting. There were all kinds of religious impulses. Yeah. Um, Yes, he he said that these zealots were using Amanita Muscaria as a sacrament and that Christ was a, was a, a symbol of the mushroom so that they could refer to the mushroom without directly referring to it so that only the believers would know. Uh, I, John Allegro's case is interesting but not entirely persuasive. Um, there needs to be more work in this area. There is something going on in the ancient Middle East about mushrooms. It's hard to reconstruct, first of all, because the climate itself has changed so much that there are no mushrooms. But uh, the, the evidence is pretty strong and getting stronger that, uh, that there was... Um, mushroom use. I reproduced in my book a picture of a mushroom object, and I was hoping I had another one here, but I guess I left it back at the apartment. Uh, man, uh, Mandianism, which is an old, old cult in that part of the world, forbids the use of mushrooms, which is puzzling since there are none, you know, and they don't forbid much but they go way out of their way to for forbid mushrooms. Uh, out of all this turmoil, I mean, it was very much like modern times. The whole Hellenistic world was awash in religious speculation. On every street corner, they were casting horoscopes and prescribing diets, and you know, there were the the temple prostitutes. So, so there was a whole uh, hedonic element uh, in sexuality. Orgy was a style in some religious organizations. And uh, out of all of this religious foment, Gnosticism, Hermeticism, Chaldean oracularism, uh, Jewish syncretism, so forth and so on, uh, and Christianity was in there. But it was just one in the crowd, but with sharpened elbows and a sense of organization, it was able to slowly worm its way into a position of dominance. The, the real Christians, whatever that means, probably were stamped out under the name of pagans. You see, what happened was the message of Christianity was that the end of the world was imminent. This is the other thing that they were into, that has also re-emerged in modern times, is the eminence of the end of the world. And um, so for about 180 years after Christ, or 150 years, everybody just was like so stoned out on this rap that no, organ no serious organization got done. And they just waited for the end of the world in little communities practicing voluntary poverty and, you know, doing their thing. And then it began to slowly dawn on people that it had been a long time since the Messiah's promise. And it was kind of stretching out a little. 
And so then certain mentalities in that situation said, uh, you know, this you know, return of the Messiah is all very well, but I think we should get some real estate under our control and uh, begin a vigorous building program and maybe uh, found some schools and stuff like that. So these religions began to become, to turn away from their end of the world ecstatic millenarianism and to see themselves as organizing for the long haul. And um, it was in this atmosphere that the Hermetic books were produced and written down. The chief magical ritual of Hermeticism is the invocation, the ability to call stellar demons down into statues. And then these statues prophesy. And uh, this is why Christianity is, uh, it takes the Jewish aversion to idol worship and just raises it to a whole new level of intensity because they, didn't, they were freaked out by this animating of statues with stellar demons thing that the Hermeticists were into. Yeah. Well, this is a good question, you know. I mean, when you're reading a 1,500-year-old account of a magical invocation, uh, if we are to believe them, what happened was by singing certain songs, burning certain incense, and performing these rituals uh, at certain times that were astrologically correct, they could cause these things called decans, which are, are zodiacal demons of some sort. There are three decans to each zodiacal sign. See, modern astrology has completely, largely forgotten this. I mean, there are people who do decanic astrology, but you have to pay through the nose because, of course, this is a lost and dying art. Uh, but they would somehow be able to draw these decans down into the statue, and then they could uh, extract knowledge from the statue. And, uh, you know, th this, is, this would lay the basis for these sympathetic magics, which were then later developed in the Renaissance. It's quite powerful, actually. This is why this book I recommended is so interesting, the one on spiritual and demonic magic by Walker because it uh, it shows you how by you living a certain life you know these renaissance princes were incredibly wealthy so you have a suite of apartments which overlook uh, uh, you know the plaza san marco in venice and Certain colors are prescribed that the walls be painted. You only wear certain kinds of robes made of certain materials. You perform your magical invocations at certain times of day, burning certain incenses. They were big on fresh air and light. It isn't the dark image of magic that we get of, you know, the stirring cauldron and the bat-faced familiar and all that. No, it's all about open air, light, wind blowing through, flowing silk robes. It, they were angelic magicians, is what they were. And they were evoking these things through the use of sigils, which are magical symbols. And then there became stress on magical alphabets, Enochian is one of these magical alphabets, or languages, rather. John Dee, remember I mentioned the whole 10-year episode with the showstone. Well, one of the subjects which these entities that Dee and Kelly were dealing with returned to again and again and again were um, the, the uh, Enochian this language, which they said was the true language that Abraham used to communicate with the angels. And it has a special alphabet, uh, an alien alphabet. 
and there has even been published an Enochian dictionary of some four or five thousand words. Uh, there was a very bizarre, this is just a footnote, but a very bizarre episode in the mid-1950s. There was a, a woman who was a kind of clairvoyant, and uh, she was in contact with flying saucers. I mean, now everybody and their dog is in contact with flying saucers. But at that time, it was fairly rare, rare enough that she became... Uh, she became an object of interest to the CIA. And at one point, she was in the CIA building in Langley, Virginia, and they were interviewing her. And, uh, and uh, she said, well, there's a, there's a flying saucer right outside the window. And, and these guys rushed to the window and looked, and there was some kind of thing in the sky. And she said... It's, it's giving me a message for you, for this colonel. <laughs> and, and, and the message was, Afa, 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 A-F-F-A. So he wrote this down. Well, then I, 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 don't, I didn't read this. I looked it up. I had a hunch. Afa is the Enochian word for nothingness. <laughs> Just more, more weirdness. Uh, angelic languages. You know, why do these DMT creatures? Uh, why are they so concerned with language? Not only language, but alphabets. I had a very weird. In fact, you know, one of the high water weirdness events of my life was when I was young. I used to. Uh, I was. I wanted the DMT flash to last longer. So I used to smoke it uh, at the height of LSD trips. And one uh, Christmas vacation, this rooming house that I managed in Berkeley had been, everybody had gone home for Christmas, I thought. And so I decided I would take some LSD and smoke DMT. And, um, and so I took the LSD and then I smoked the DMT. It was just nuts. I mean, it's nuts enough, but this was like turbocharged nuts. It went on and on and on. And finally, I, uh, there was a woman who I rented a room to upstairs uh, named uh, Rosemary, who was supposed to be in Minnesota. And she was an a actress and very projective and did everything with great flair. And she apparently came back early from Christmas vacation. So she hit the front steps running of this house and, and used her key to let herself into the front door and came right around to my door and started beating on my door. Well, I am by nature a very paranoid person. I mean... I can be up the Rio Yaguas Yasu in the middle of the Amazon basin, and if I'm out in the rainforest smoking a joint and a stick is broken anywhere near me, I immediately hide the dope. You know, and just, you know, I'm very paranoid. So this woman lets herself in and comes and beats with her clenched fist on, on my bedroom door. Well, I like underwent a, a coronary thrombosis or something, and I was in the elf space, and they were screeching and chattering and showing me all this stuff. And when she did this, I, like, I, I flew off the bed. I jumped, like, I jumped two feet in the air and, and landed on my feet. And it was, it was as though, and don't try this at home, folks. It, it, it was as though the, uh, this sudden flash of adrenaline and this sudden movement that I made broke up the ordinary division between the trip and norm, normality or something. Anyway, I pulled the trip with me into the room. I was now standing in the room, eyes open, but the, the elf creatures had come with me, and everything had just been like jacked up to some immense level of intensity, and there were these rotating geometric things 
in the room, uh, hanging in the air. And it was like moving in this jerky motion. This thing was going click, click, click. And it was faceted. And every time it would make this large metallic click, these plastic triangle-shaped, brightly colored chits or something, like little pieces of, of floor tile or something, would fly across the room. And each one of them had a letter on it in an alien language, sort of like Hebrew or Sanskrit. And it was just, there were several of these machines and these things were ricocheting off the walls, and I had an elf hanging off each hand, and I was turning around, and I was just saying, "Holy shit!" You know, I've pulled, I pull, I'm, 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 I, I, and I, and then she's still beating on the door, you know. So I stagger over to the door, fling it back, and look at her and say something like, "Way duquam waxi ho and then she realized at that point what my problem was and, uh, and retreated. But I've, I've never forgotten. It's the one time that, it, that they went literary on me. And not only did I see them, not only did I hear them, but I, they were printing on the air the message as well. Very curious. I mean, we don't, yeah. Yeah, it's. <laughs> I don't know. The first, the first few times I smoked DMT, I had almost no ability to say anything about it at all. I remember the first time I did it. I've never actually seen it hit anybody quite as hard as it hit me the first time. I came out of it, and I said, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I don't believe it. it. I don't believe it. And I said this about 200 times because I just, my life, I was blown out of the water. I'd spent years getting my act together and becoming a Marxist and a this and a that and had all this stuff all figured out, you know. And it just left me absolutely intellectually naked. It was that everything you know is wrong experience, except that it was from the toes, you know. I mean, everything I knew was wrong. I've never forgotten it. I mean, it is the most, uh, I don't know, it's like hitting the reset button on your whole cosmogonic myth. I mean, it, you just, uh, it's the convincer. You know, you occasionally meet people who say, oh, you people who take drugs, listen, you think I believe that this is anything more than you just hyping yourself up on this? You say, listen, you got ten minutes to put into exploring that point of view. Check this out, because it's, uh, it's confounding. I mean, people sometimes ask me, is it dangerous? It is if you fear death by astonishment. <laughs> you know? Astonishment is something we rarely experience as the genuine article. We fake it. Say, oh, you've really surprised me. But, hey, <laughs> surprise, surprise. Uh, it can really get wrathy. Yeah. You mentioned this ancient cult that forbade the use of the mushroom. What were their beliefs? Why did they? Uh, Mandianism? Well, Mandianism is a very old religion. Um, it arose around Jerusalem in the, a couple of centuries before Christ. It was a baptismal cult. And uh, I'm, I'm really into the Mandians, actually. They were the oldest continuous Western religion in the world. Uh, uh, with a Gnostic intent, and they started, and they were probably, they started out as Jews, but they were persecuted. They claimed John the Baptist as one of their own, and he was a member of some kind of baptismal cult, because we know he baptized Christ. But they, they were driven out of uh, 
the area around Jerusalem, and then for centuries they were in Lebanon, and then they slowly made their way across Persia, and uh, they ended up in the swamps of Iraq and Iran. I know someone from there who calls him from Baghdad. Do you? Is he from Basra? Is he from Basra, that city in the south? It's a very, huh? Still there. Yeah, there are about a million of them. Why, how do you know? I heard about that footage. People in London told me that they had seen it. I, I, he tells me that because they're discriminated against. You don't go around advertising the bar for these, you know, people don't like them. And oh no, they don't like them. Well, Mandayans are very, very interesting. They, uh... uh they're taking tests. Yes, they have their own written language, although in 1847 there was a cholera epidemic that wiped out 90% of the priesthood, and only priests were allowed to learn to read and write this language. I have some uh, facsimile manuscripts from the Vatican Library. I sort of think that we all should become Mandaeans, that of all the religions I've ever looked at and studied, it seems to me the most psychedelic, the most sort of ethically correct. I mean, they are in there, and it would be a great religion to practice on a world scale because they're into caring for the land. They're river nuts. They love rivers, and they build their, they build a cult hut called a mandai, and they always divert a little ditch through it. And then they do their their ritual baptisms and stuff like that there. But their folk tales and their uh, religious beliefs are very interesting. It's like a religion of biology. The highest god in Mandayanism is called Hibble Zaiwa. And Hibble Zaiwa is always referred to as they. So it's that they are in charge. And it's uh, beautiful scriptural stuff. Uh, they're very much like Orthodox Jews, only more so in that if you're a, a, a religious Mandayan, your life is ruled by all kinds of uh, things, sort of like the rules of kosher. The most difficult rule that these people are asked to keep in their own lives is that if you're really a devout Mandayan, you are considered polluted if your eye falls on an unbeliever. And an unbeliever is a non-Mandayan. So you can imagine uh, how difficult it is when you're down to four or five hundred people to make sure that's the only people you ever see. The only profession that a Mandayan man can uh, follow and not require ritual decontamination every day is silversmithing. So if you ever go to Baghdad, <laughs> not likely too soon, but if you ever go to Baghdad or Basra or Kirkuk, there are communities of these people and you find them by going to the silver markets. And then through discreet inquiry, uh, you you can find them. Well, in if in folklore, uh, if folklorists, folkloric anthropologists have developed all these rules. If a religion makes something taboo, you can usually bet that that means they were into it at some point. Because when a religion makes something taboo, it means that there has been a reformist upheaval inside the religion. This is probably how Soma was lost to the ancient Hindus, you know. Uh, uh, it's how Zoroaster was called the great reformer. And he was the great reformer because he suppressed a lot of indigenous shamanic cults. Uh, and some people think that he actually attempted to suppress Haoma. And Haoma is the Avestan uh, counterpart of Soma. 
if any of you are interested in all this, this book by Flattery and Schwartz called, uh, uh, what is it called? Haoma and Harmaline in Iranian Religion. It's from the University of California Press. And they make a very strong case that Soma couldn't, was not mushrooms, that it was Pagaman Harmala. And it's really a great, it's a really interesting book. I mean, I learned things that I didn't know. For instance, uh, in the pre-Zoroastrian phase of Iranian religion, drugs were not only used to access the spiritual world, but they actually said there was no other way to do it, which is sort of my position. So it was nice to know that these pre-Zoroastrian Iranian light religions, uh, they, they were into what they called the Menog, M-E-N-O-G, the Menog, and it's another dimension. And you can only attain knowledge of it through the use of drugs, but the Manong existence is where the dead people are. And what their religion was about was you get to know your own soul through using drugs, and you approach the, it's like, a, it's like visiting somebody in stir. You go and your soul comes and meets you, comes through the Manong existence and meets you at the membrane. And the idea is that during life, you must learn to recognize your soul. Because after death, if you can't pick it out of the soul swarm, then you will be somehow uh, incompleted in the after death world. Yeah. To attain death by astonishment. <laughs> DMT raises the possibility of death by astonishment. I was talking to somebody about it last night, saying, you know, when you take DMT, the question is not, <laughs> will I be all right? The question is, have I lived through it or not? <laughs> because you can't tell whether you've lived through it. DMT is this very short-acting hallucinogen that you smoke, but it's a neurotransmitter. It occurs in all human beings on the natch, and it occurs in a various plants and animals. In terms of nature, it's the commonest of all hallucinogens. In terms of impact, it's the strongest of all hallucinogens. I mean, it's a completely reality-obliterating experience, and it comes on so quickly that you don't, grok it like a drug. I mean, we all know what a drug is. You know, you feel this, you feel that. It gets stronger. It makes you rest. Finally, it overwhelms you. This isn't like that. This is like that, you know, you and your friends are somewhere and there's talk about this drug and the pipe gets filled and this and that. And then you're about to smoke this drug or maybe you just smoked it. But anyway, a 747 crashes into your apartment building at three times the speed of sound and interrupts whatever you were doing. And sometimes people come out of it saying, you know, what happened? What happened for crying out loud? Say, nothing happened. You just did it. I mean, say, you mean that's it? Say, yeah, that, that's what it does. Because it is not, it's more like, it happens so quickly that we interpret it as an event coming from the outside rather than a, a, a chemical compound diffusing through your body. Because it completely replaces reality, not with the contents of your unconscious or your unfulfilled dream wishes or any of that, but with an, another dimension a space filled with entities busy about their many tasks, although they notice you and come flocking over with a piercing screech and begin to, uh, they like to treat with you. They play with you. They're not entirely friendly. It's sort of like 
I don't know, it's the kind of feeling I used to have in India when I would go to make these hash buys in these Indian markets and these guys would say, you know, welcome, welcome, you're my friend, I am not like all the others. <laughs> And what it was, was, you know, we were there to do business, and so it was fine, and everything usually went smoothly, but this was no environment into which to let your guard down, or anything like that. You've had your hand. What does it do? What does the do it in our brain as a neurotransmitter? We don't know. Nobody knows what it's doing there, and as long as the government makes it impossible for science to pursue rational questions or rational answers to these kinds of questions, it's not likely we'll ever find out. The best guess so far is that it mediates attention. That, for instance, if there were to be a noise over here or movement, and I turn and I... that that's a little spike of DMT makes that possible. It's where you suddenly narrow your awareness and project it deeply into a small confined area. This was the best guess of the people who did work on it a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, there are a number of physioactive uh, tryptamines. Uh, DMT is not, if it's made right, not a cardioactive tryptamine. Sometimes when you smoke it, your heart races, but you can't tell whether that's sloppy synthesis or that you're scared, you know. It's made from tryptophan, which is an amino acid, one of the eight essential amino acids, and it's an easy conversion out of tryptophan. Just from a plant. Well, it can come from a plant, but if you were to ask a chemist to make it for you, he'd ask you to get him a, a few hundred grams of tryptophan. Well, on mushrooms, you hear a voice. You don't rarely, at least in my experience, do you see who's talking. But on DMT, you, you all, all barriers are transcended in the first 30 seconds. I mean, you hear it, you see it, and sometimes you feel it, you know. These little entities, these self-dribbling basketballs, these things that I call the tykes, they jump into your chest. They jump into your chest, and then they jump out again. I don't know why they do that. In the Amazon, among the tribes that use DMT, derived from plants, they say, they call these spirit things, they call them hikuli. And they say that you're supposed to not, that they will jump into your chest, and then you're supposed to have a technique to keep them from getting out. And the number of these things that you trap inside your body cavity means, indicates how powerful a shaman you are. Your magic is done through the hikulis that are trapped uh, inside of you. So you really don't have to see what mushrooms? You do, but it's fleeting. It's like, you know, it's, it's different. With DMT, it is more real than this experience of sitting in this room is real. I mean, it is confounding. It's very hard on DMT to tell yourself, this is a drug. I mean, good Lord, it doesn't seem like it. It seems like you just tunneled through an energy barrier into the beta sub x dimension which is all the time all around us but somehow you just became virtual and moved across the energy barrier and there you are you know and the other thing about dmt that's weird is it does not affect your mind in other words you don't feel gaga with ecstasy you don't feel relaxed. You feel exactly the way you felt before you did it. It's that the world has just been swapped out. And, and that's strange. I, I sort of like that, that it doesn't lay a glove on the observing 
cognitive processes. Instead, it just does something in the visual cortex that causes the, the world to be replaced by a three, four, five dimensional, highly colored, moving environment filled with screaming elf demons. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> no. More like 50 milligrams. We need to go to lunch. This is the last clip. Um, I heard somewhere that concomitant use of MAO inhibitors increases the length of time that um, the DMT experience will last. Have you heard that? And if so, in what form are the MAO inhibitors taken? Okay, the question is that can you extend the life of a DMT flash if you predose yourself with MAO inhibitors? The answer is probably this is really a don't try this at home folks maneuver unless you really know your MAO inhibitors. Uh, there are MAO inhibitors synthetics uh, that will inhibit every molecule of MAO in your body for up to six weeks after a single exposure. This you don't need. Uh, uh, an excellent MAO inhibitor for these purposes would be harmine or harmaline, which is uh, which is uh, reversible in four to six hours. So if you take harmine and pre-dose it, but before you go extending your DMT trip with an MAO inhibitor, you better have just a, a, an ordinary, old-fashioned, regular DMT <laughs> trip and decide whether you really want to spend <laughs> more time in that place. Because, see, the hook is, especially for smart-ass straight types, is that you say, look, it only lasts 10 minutes, for crying out loud. You want to have all these opinions on this subject, but you're not willing to invest 10 minutes. So most people, certainly I, the first, I said, I had taken LSD and all, and I thought, <laughs> 10 minutes, uh, bring it on. We'll go out and have a beer afterwards. Well, it turns out that in a holographic universe, 10 minutes is indistinguishable from 50,000 years under the property.